Uh, welcome to the sixth in a series of webinars as part of the Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers Project. This project from Kairos Canada is funded by the Government of Canada's Temporary Foreign Worker Program. My name is David Ivany and I'm part of the Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers team and I'm honored to facilitate this webinar today. Uh, also joining me from the microjustice team at Kairos are uh, Shannon, Cheryl, uh, and Alfredo. So hello everyone. Uh, and if you want more information about the project, you can go to the Kairos Canada website. So I would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on today is the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. We thank them for allowing us to meet and learn together on their territories. To the original caretakers of this land of which we stand, I acknowledge the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, where I am right now. To all that was here for thousands of years before us across Turtle Island, we honor the struggles and the lives of those who gave themselves for it. For all those here today, we acknowledge the ancestors beneath our feet and the land on which we stand. With our ears to the ground, we can hear them. The Cree Nation, the Métis, the Diné, the Anishinaabe, the Dakota and Lakota Nations, the Inuit, the Blackfoot, the Inu, Inu, and all nations that came before us and those yet to become. An infinity of footsteps of those who long called this land home, the unfolding of bundles, the undoing of colonization, and the opening of this land to allow treaty to come alive. We affirm our relationship to each other and to the land. We acknowledge and pay respects to the indigenous nations and ancestors of this land. Once again, I acknowledge the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples where I am right now. This webinar, Vaccines and Migrant Workers, Accessibility, Concerns, Myths and Facts, protection and prevention, staying healthy in times of COVID-19, will explore how we can help migrant workers have accurate information they need to make informed decisions about vaccinations. First, we will, we will go through a review of vaccines and vaccine information uh, with a question period with doctors afterwards. Then we will look at key issues around vaccination and migrant workers. And finally, we'll hear from people with experience in vaccination clinics in Ontario. The agenda is quite full, uh, so I would say let's get started. Uh, so first to talk about the vaccines and vaccine information, we have Dr. Catherine Yu and Dr. Willem von Heinegen. Dr. Catherine Yu is a family physician and medical director of Health Access, Thorncliff Park, as well as an assistant professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. She was an emergency physician for 10 years and is now a passionate advocate for her family practice patients, becoming a recipient of the 2019 Ontario College of Family Physicians Award of Excellence for her leadership in supporting vulnerable populations. In her role as medical director, physician engagement and health systems designs at HATP, Dr. Yu has been establishing strong collaborative relationships between the health, social, and educational neighborhood agencies in order to implement intersectional and seamless delivery of care to patients. Dr. Yu is also chair of the board of directors for the East Toronto Family Practice Network, a network of family physicians with a mission to create equitable access to interprofessional care for all family practices. And Dr. Willem van Hunnigan, Dr. Will, uh, works as a family doctor at Woolwich Community Health Centre in Wellesley, Ontario. He has also worked for over the past decade as an occasional physician with migrant worker health clinics with various various initiatives, particularly OCAO and the Grand River Community Health Center. Dr. Will first gained an interest in supporting migrant workers after visiting them in rural Ontario, as well as communities in both Mexico and Jamaica with his wife and migrant work, worker scholar, Janet McLaughlin. 
So with that, I give it over to the doctors. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, hi, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I, I just um, wanted to say that uh, a shout out to those of you who work in the CHC. I certainly work for Flemington Community Health Centre and I think we are here with a lot of knowledge together and I'm actually here to learn as well. I, I'm, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak at a high level around um, the COVID-19 vaccination, but I certainly won't um, come, I'm not here as an expert. Uh, I'm here as a colleague, um, happy to share what we've been doing from the perspective of working within East Toronto and from the urban perspective. And um, I, I gather there's our, our audience includes many um, from outside of the city, of course. And I'm, I'm grateful that uh, Will is here with me to do the presentation and who also brings that lens. Um, I hope that if folks can see my uh, the slides that uh, Will and I had uh, put together. Um, can I get a thumbs up if you're actually seeing the slides? Um, so we were uh, asked to give a little bit of an overview of um, COVID vaccination uh, in Canada and uh, Eduardo kindly uh, gave us a, a number of sort of, I guess, common questions that have uh, come up in his experience with uh, uh, migrant worker support uh, groups. Um, I guess the first uh, sort of question was around the uh, status of vaccination in Canada. And as most of you are probably well aware, it, it's it's ramped up significantly. Thank you. Um, in in uh, globally, uh, at this point, there's been over over a billion vaccine doses that have have been have been administered. Um, in Canada, as of April 23rd, uh, we've had about 10, uh, 10 million people uh, who have received a single dose of COVID, uh, of a COVID vaccine, and that amounts to about 25% of the population, um, and around, well, uh, just under 1 million who have received uh, two doses, so would have been fully vaccinated, and as you know, that's in part due to the uh, um, uh, the emphasis on getting a first dose uh, in to provide some partial immunity uh, as opposed to getting everyone quickly vaccinated uh, with the two doses. Um, in Ontario at this point, there have been um, almost 5 million doses uh, administered and about 360,000 people who are fully vaccinated. So uh, globally, uh, I guess we were asked just to comment about that. Uh, as you can see from this map, uh, there is significant sort of, you know, vaccine inequity. Uh, we can see uh, in the United States, so it's color coded, the darker colors would indicate higher vaccination rates um, and the lighter colors lower. Um, we're uh, in Canada, we're sort of near near the near the top. Um, the United States, it's uh, you know almost fifty percent, from what I understand. Here in Canada, we're at about like I said, twenty five to to thirty percent. Um, by comparison, here on the, on the map, they they show Ghana, which uh, only has uh, two point eight percent that have been vaccinated. Of course, with the communities that you would be dealing with, uh, the migrant workers tend to come from, uh, you know, Mexico, um, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago. So, in those countries, um, Mexico, uh, my understanding is it, it, it's maybe around 10% uh, vaccination uh, rates right now with the with the first dose, um, and in. Jamaica, I believe it's um, it's lower, maybe about five percent. So significantly fewer people have been vaccinated in those communities. I think I think in Trinidad it's it's even a bit lower uh, yet. We've been asked to speak a little bit about the, um, Ontario's COVID vaccina vaccination rollout plan. And I come at this from the perspective of a, a community family physician who has been involved in systems planning in, in the local neighborhood level, as well as uh, an advocate for the communities that I serve in terms of getting more supplies to those at high risk. 
Um, it is a complicated um, rollout plan, um, but I hope that in the next few slides, I can provide a bit of an overview that can help us um, navigate our uh, migrant workers and our patients to the, to the right place to access the vaccines. Um, I recognize that in the audience, we've also got somebody from Winnipeg, welcome. Um, I have been asked to speak about Ontario, and I actually am curious as to how the rest of Canada is faring on this. Um, as folks know, the vaccination rollout plan is a collective effort. Um, there's the federal government um, who secures the vaccines for us from um, outside of the country. As you know, the supply um, is not coming from internally, so we don't have production of vaccines in our country. Um, and Ontario's vaccination plan is specifically um, rolled out according to the following phases, um, where phase one is high risk populations that are being served um, initially. And then there's phase two. Since early April, vaccines have been offered to migrant agricultural workers as part of phase two of the vaccination rollout. Phase two of the vaccination rollout in general has focused on older adults, people in high risk settings, frontline essential workers, and other populations that are at greatest risk of illness. The migrant workers are prioritized under, quote, the employer provided living accommodations for temp temporary foreign agricultural workers in the top prioritization during phase two. So they should have been at this point in time, depending on which public health unit you are in, eligible to get vaccines. As we will hear a bit about today, the vaccination offering to migrant culture, agricultural workers has taken place through pilot clinics, as well as now ongoing vaccination rollout clinics. These clinics have been regional, um, happening with workers traveling to centralized community clinic locations or to mobile clinics or on farm clinics that are set up, as well as through an airport vaccination clinic initiative at Pearson Airport in Toronto. So there are a number of factors that affect access to vaccines. The number one um, uh, factor that ha has really been impacting our, impacting our distribution and rollout of the vaccine is the supply. I mentioned earlier, vaccines are not produced locally in Canada and we are certainly um, basically uh, having to uh, work with our uh, other partners around the world to uh, bring vaccines to us. Different public health units vary with regards to its, dis its distribution plan. As mentioned earlier, I know in East Toronto, what we've been tasked to do is to try and distribute our vaccinations through mass vaccination centers, primarily um, the city of Toronto sponsored mass vaccination centers. We've understood that these max vaccination clinics um, over the course of the first few weeks of implementing this type of rollout distribution are not the best places for many of our newcomers and, and um, uh, uh, patients with navigation um, challenges to access vaccines in. So we've moved towards a much more hands-on approach in getting into the community. I know that the neighborhood organization has been a strong partner in our Thorncliffe neighborhood um, approach, for example. We've been moving more towards mobile unit clinics, um, specifically in pop-up formats where we, um, without as much um, long-term um, um, notice to the community, uh, have pop-ups that, uh, as vaccine supply suddenly becomes available, as well as as data comes in, around hotspots in terms of all of Toronto. So what hotspots are, are those high-risk neighborhoods. And um, the, the high-risk neighborhoods are identified based on the most recent COVID prevalence data, which of course changes every day. And the idea is that as we quickly get the data on where the highest prevalence uh, is, that we would quickly respond to that by um, doing the race against COVID with vaccination strategies that are particularly targeting the hotspot neighborhoods. Vaccination for workers are strongly recommended, but not mandatory. This is um, even the same as for healthcare providers. Um, vaccination is based on a personal choice and workers should not face reprisals if they don't get vaccinated or choose not to get vaccinated. 
do you know that um, vaccination is not the end of it all? Uh, we actually continue to encourage and must encourage our, uh, all of those who get vaccinated to continue following COVID-19 safety practices and precautions. As a family physician myself, this is one thing that I really uh, would say to all of my patients is that it is your personal choice. Let's look at the particular nuances that you consider in terms of making that decision for yourself. I am a big vaccine advocate. I think given the risks and the tragedy that I've seen in terms of the number of deaths around COVID cases, I am really pushing hard for my patients to really consider vaccination. However, I do sit down with them and uh, go over uh, what it is that means more to them and their particular situation that would um, help them make the decision that they feel comfortable with. I uh, was asked to talk, uh, I guess, a little bit about the vaccines that have been approved in Canada so far and um, the mechanisms they employ. Uh, just, uh, you know, a caveat is that I am not a pharmacists or uh, an expert at, at uh, you know, uh, biochemistry. So it'll be more just a family doctor kind of perspective uh, on these. Um, so cur currently in, in Canada, there are four vaccines uh, approved for use, uh, and they broadly work based on, on two, two sort of mechanisms. So they're um, uh, the, the first one is uh, their mRNA vaccines uh, and the Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna uh, vaccines use uh, that, that mechanism. Um, and just, you know, broadly how they work is uh, mRNA is, uh, uh, you know, a single stranded molecule that basically is instructions for uh, coding proteins. So uh, synthetic mRNA uh, is, is generated uh, and put into a vaccine. It's coated in a, a little lipid molecule in order to protect it, uh, and that is injected. And the mRNA goes into the, um, uh, after injection, enters cells and basically teaches, tells cells how to make the spike protein. And the spike protein is the protein that is uh, on uh, the coronavirus, uh, and it uses that protein to get into cells. Uh, so it's an ideal target for vaccines um, because uh, once your body uh, produces antibodies to it, it, uh, it uh, could um, neutralize uh, the actual COVID virus if you were to become infected. A couple things, I guess, that uh, just in terms of misconceptions around uh, the mRNA. So um, it is not a live uh, virus. It's just uh, instructions on how to make one particular protein uh, on the COVID virus. Uh, there's no uh, effect or interaction with uh, DNA um, in any way. Uh, the uh, virus, in fact, never, nothing enters the nucleus, which is where DNA is. Um, and, um, once the cell, you know, produces the spike protein, uh, it, uh, essentially gets neutralized by your, uh, immune system and, uh, your immune system thereby learns how to, um, recognize, uh, that spike protein. And if you were to get infected, you could immediately neutralize and, and thereby, um, uh, prevent severe infection. So the mRNA vaccines have been shown to be quite effective. Um, the uh, uh, both are about ninety-five percent effective at uh, preventing infection two weeks after the second dose. Um, there is, of course, partial protection after the first dose, um, uh, which is why we're we're promoting uh, that as a starting a starting point. Um, and it's been shown to be actually also very effective at preventing severe disease. So even if you are in the small percentage who could still get COVID infections, um, you're much less likely to need hospitalization. Um, the other class of vaccines uh, are known as viral vector vaccines, and that would be the Oxford AstraZeneca or the Johnson & Johnson products. Um, so in those products, they actually um, 
the uh, vaccine uses a, an, a, it's called an adenovirus, which is a type of virus that's typically linked to, you know, for instance, the common cold, a fairly harmless virus. Uh, and that uh, virus has been um, genetically engineered to not be able to replicate. So normally a virus, you know, enters your body and replicates and would produce an infection. In this case, the virus cannot replicate. So, um, and they've also further um, engineered the, uh, the, this adenovirus to produce that same spike protein that I mentioned in the uh, previous slide. Uh, so in this case, the, um, the viral vector vaccine uh, would be injected and uh, the adenovirus gets um, um, essentially enters cells uh, and then uh, um, the DNA within the uh, adenovirus uh, gets pushed into the nucleus and they uh, use uh, the, the cells, um, uh, I guess, the cells protein uh, making mechanism to then produce that spike protein. Uh, and at that point, it's kind of uh, the same as the RNA, mRNA vi vaccines where uh, the protein is produced, it gets presented on the cell and recognized by the immune system. And the uh, immune system then is able to recognize that spike protein for a, any future uh, uh, infections with actual uh, coronavirus. Thanks, Will. I mean, the, the, the um, explanation to the science behind the mRNA and the viral vector vaccines is a very difficult one. And uh, Will, that was a, an amazing explanation. Um, I, I would just like to share as part of um, the work for vaccination hesitancy that I've been involved with over the past couple of months, I've been um, surprised to be seeing so much misinformation as I'm sure um, many of you already know of. Um, and uh, they're through different social media channels, uh, WhatsApp, Facebook, what have you. And I think that it's one of those important aspects that we need to support our patients and our clients with in terms of just muddling through what information to actually take in and understand and, and believe in. Um, and so that was uh, sort of our uh, thought around the attempt to kind of explain um, the mechanisms behind the mRNA vaccine as well as the viral vector vaccine. It's very complicated, but it's uh, absolutely an amazing um, advancement in science. And I myself have had uh, the, been lucky to actually receive the mRNA vaccines and both of them um, and knock on wood um, and have been, uh, uh, been wearing proper PPE and have been working the past uh, year since the pandemic began with uh, as a frontline worker with patients and have been have stayed well. I wanted to comment a little bit about the clinical trials and racial or ethnic diversity among participants and to just share and probably something that our community of um, patients would be very interested in hearing about is that there is good clinical data on the inc inclusion of racially diverse participants in clinical trials. Before a vaccine is approved for use, it is tested on a large number of people to confirm that it works and is safe. These are called clinical trials. Scientists who tested the COVID-19 vaccines included thousands of people in their trials, including racially and ethnically diverse populations. For example, the study for the Moderna vaccine included about 30,000 people. Although conducted mainly in the United States, there was a focus on including people of diverse racial and ethnic groups in the study. And it included approximately 11,000 people from communities of diverse backgrounds to ensure its safety across different populations. The Pfizer vaccine, was, the study was conducted in the USA, Argentina, Brazil, Germany, South Africa, and Turkey. The Janssen or Johnson & Johnson vaccine study took place in the USA, Brazil, South Africa, as well as five other countries in Latin America, including Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Peru, and Mexico. The analysis of the AstraZeneca vaccine combined two studies that took place in Brazil and the United Kingdom. 
So based on clinical trial data, these vaccines have been noted to prevent disease very effectively. And these vaccines, of course, had passed the Health Canada rigorous process to be approved in our country. However, I must say we do not have long-term data to be definitive about how long the effect of these vaccines are going to last. I wonder, this is a personal um, thought as a scientist uh, with, with some uh, medical and scientific background, but certainly the evidence is yet to come for this, is whether we will be expecting booster vaccinations over time um, in the next several years, much as we have flu vaccines um, and a booster shot of that every year. So as, as a provider that's given lots and lots of vaccines and seen many patients who've been vaccinated, some of the common side effects that we've seen and are well documented are soreness at the site of the injection, body chills, chills, feeling tired and feeling feverish. By far, most of those who I've vaccinated or have I've spoken to and have been documented to have been vaccinated will report some of these side effects. They're quite, they're minor. For, and, and they usually last around 48 hours or so, sometimes a little longer. I think it's very important for us to guide our clients who get vaccinated to understand whether they're having a serious reaction or a common side effect. Common side effects will, uh, will not cause any harm, um, but of course the serious side effects are the ones that we need to look out for. When do we know that it's serious? Well, if the side effects such as fever, for example, last more than a couple of days, they should really be seeking medical attention. Sometimes for some of our patients, it's the first time they've head out to actually be in a, um, outside their apartments or their, their buildings. And unfortunately, there are some rare stories where I've heard that they've actually, this is where their first um, out, outing, and that's when they actually pick up COVID before their vaccination has actually become infected. So very important for folks to actually understand that if they're having a fever for more than a couple of days shortly after their vaccination to seek medical attention. As mentioned earlier, the serious side effects are extremely rare. Um, as part, as vaccination continues, this clinical studies do continue, and as part of this, public health agencies in different countries may pause and reassess certain vaccines, adjust their use. We've certainly seen this in Canada um, as part of ensuring the vaccines are safe and effective. Um, I think it's worth discussing briefly what anaphylaxis is. Um, anaphylaxis is rare. It is a serious allergic reaction to the vaccination. By far, majority of anaphylactic reactions occur within the first 15 minutes after the vaccination is given. So the vaccination centers are, have usual protocols that involve obs an observation period after a vaccine is given, so that if an anaphylactic reaction happens, there are care providers and healthcare professionals around the receiver of the vaccine um, to help right away. While it is a serious um, side effect, as mentioned, rare, um, it is something that we are well versed in as healthcare providers to respond to, often with an epinephrine injection, much like when somebody has a peanut allergy, for example. It's usually uh, manifested as uh, swelling, shortness of breath, uh, maybe a drop in blood pressure and feeling faint. Um, and um, really, if there's any concern, seek, seeking medical attention is uh, very important. Now, in my experience with hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of patients that have already fortunately been vaccinated in Thorncliffe, thankfully I haven't, I have yet to see an anaphylactic reaction. So I'm just stressing how rare it is, but how important it is for us to be looking out for this. Thank you, Dr. Yu. So um, I was asked to speak, I guess, a little bit about rare side effects that maybe people have been reading about in the news. Um, I think this might be actually uh, also an opportunity to get if, if anybody has specific questions, uh, but I think I would address um, one of the um, newsworthy items that probably people have been hearing a lot about, which would be the AstraZeneca um, complications that we've seen in, in, uh, in uh, some rare cases. Um, so uh, I guess one, one other thing I should mention is my, my understanding is that the uh, migrant uh, 
workers are uh, getting the Moderna vaccination when they, uh, or are being offered the Moderna vaccination uh, when they do come. So the AstraZeneca, this may not even be uh, necessarily an issue um, that you would have to um, ad address when you're uh, talking uh, to migrant workers, but nevertheless, it's good to know about it. Um, so uh, the, um, the the main thing, there's a, a, a rare a, a complication that can occur. Um, it seems to be happening in about uh, maybe one in uh, 100,000 to one in 250,000 cases um, where the uh, immune uh, response to the vaccine uh, is quite strong and you can get um, uh, uh, some rare complications of uh, certain blood clots uh, and decreased, uh, decreased platelets, which are like cells involved in the blood clotting process. Um, the, uh, it's important to kind of um, look at, I guess, the how common this um, side effect can occur versus the complications and uh, that we would see from COVID infection. Um, so um, that's an important, I guess, discussion to have with uh, anybody who is uh, kind of asking questions about this. Um, the, the particular blood clot that we do, we do see with this is uh, um, a type of blood clot uh, that can occur in, in the brain. It's uh, venous sinus thrombosis. So uh, what would, uh, what, you know, if, if somebody were to get the AstraZeneca vaccine, we would typically warn them that if they were to have severe uh, headaches uh, lasting, you know, uh, beyond three days or other unusual side effects like bruising uh, or bleeding, that they should uh, seek um, uh, immediate medical uh, care so that they can get tested to make sure this is not occurring. Um, so yeah, so I guess the the like I said, the risk the risk seems to be quite low, um, um, and the uh, given the risks uh, and benefits, of course, of the of the vaccination, uh, I think generally uh, the public health agencies would say that the. Uh, the benefits far uh, outweigh the risk and AstraZeneca is still recommended um, uh, as a vaccine to prevent COVID infection. Yeah, and, and I guess this, uh, this is just to say that if there are any questions about it that, uh, you know, one of the migrant, the migrant workers may have, that it's always, uh, you know, advisable to connect with uh, uh, a primary care provider um, so that they can discuss their specific situation right so it's it's different everybody has their own circuit sort of circumstances and risks risk of complications if they were to get covid um, and obviously the migrant worker population is at an increased risk because of the congregate living and the rapid spread that can occur in those settings um, um, and and um, so all of these things would have to be taken into account and then also the health uh, the personal health issues that a migrant worker may have. So it's best to discuss those with uh, a primary care provider if possible, which of course I know is tricky because of the nature of their employment and, and getting healthcare is not always straightforward, but if possible, that would always be advisable if there are any questions. That's great. I, I just wanted to, um, we love to uh, answer questions and open it up for discussion, but I, I did want to just add one thing around our experience with AstraZeneca. Um, you know, it, I think that it's quite unfortunate that it's gotten such bad press in terms of a vaccine in itself. Um, when we look at the numbers, one in 250,000 um, is a very small number risk compared to the high rates in some areas of our hotspot neighborhoods, um, up to 20% um, prevalence of COVID vaccination when we screen certain populations in certain neighborhoods. And the risks of blood clots if you do contract, um, uh, contract COVID is also quite high. So, you know, I, I guess it's all about weighing the risks and the benefits and what one is willing to take and what, what isn't. And certainly I'd be very uh, um, respectful of the personal choices of all of my patients. But I do um, worry about some of them 
when I know that they're at a higher risk and this is the only available vaccine. Um, you know, I would say that if this is the only vaccine available to you, I would absolutely um, jump on this and, and get it. Uh, you know, the I, I could share some stories of some of my patients that have unfortunately gotten COVID um, and I wasn't able to provide a vaccine to them because there was no supply. Um, and it's, it's just, it's one of those very hard discussions to have. And I could imagine that as we support, as many of you in the call support migrant workers themselves, and we have a personal relationship with them, um, that it's even harder to watch them get sick. You know, it's not just a number or a population that we're serving, right? It's, it's a one-to-one -one relationship that we have. And I have been in that situation where I've seen somebody get sick and wish that I'd been able to provide a vaccine. Thank you so much for all of that information. I've learned quite a bit. <laughs> um, I have a few questions already in the chat. So um, Luz was wondering, uh, like they're both mRNA vaccines. Uh, like is the Pfizer and Moderna, are the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines the same or um, yes, or is there a difference? <laughs> So I guess I can, I can speak to that a little bit is, uh, I don't know if I'm, am I still, I'm not muted, right? No, okay. no I can hear you. you can hear me. Okay. Yeah. So they are very similar in terms of how their underlying mechanism works, but they are different vaccines produced by different companies. Um, so they, at this point are, you know, for instance, not interchangeable. It's not that you can get one and then get a your second dose of another. Uh, in fact, the time frames, the recommended time frames, are a little bit different for the second dose anyway. Um, but the uh, the way they work, the efficacy, like how well they work, the side effect profile um, are all actually uh, quite quite similar. Um, uh, I can't say that I've I've run into any ma major differences between the two. Okay, thanks. And before I get to the next question, uh, to let you to let everyone know, um, if you want to raise your hand, uh, you can click on reactions and raise your hand, and we will uh, get to you. And then whatever questions are put in the chat, I will move into the uh, into the conversation. So uh, I have a hand from uh, Christina Gomez and then we'll get to the next uh, chat question. Yeah, my question is, um, okay, we had the, the vaccine and as the doctor says, uh, it's going to be, um, I can say 90% of protection for the person who have the vaccine. What happened? And what will be the percent of protection when you have to wait eight weeks after you get the second doses? Because I believe that the percent of the, the um, uh, effect, uh, I can say the percent of cover for that person is going to get down. So if we see that, that we we don't have cover in the third or four um the lowest percent of cover for the second doses is going to affect the person that means that that person had to get the third shot because the percent of the cover is going to be down after he wait four weeks of six weeks after he get the second dose very good question. It's a question that I've been asked a few times before, and I, I appreciate the question being asked. If I, um, if we had, a, a, you know, unlimited supply and had the control over that, uh, ideally we would get the vaccinations as soon as um, they're meant to be given in terms of the studies and the available information that we have. I don't know that we will know exactly what the answer to that question is for a little while yet because the studies haven't been completed. Um, 
you know, it is unfortunate that we don't have enough that we have to space things out. However, we do know that when you have at least one vaccination and more of us are vaccinated, then collectively we are protecting each other um, from getting COVID. Um, the other piece that I would want to share, and, and this is, again, take this information with a bit of caution without as much evidence um, available, but certainly from many of my colleagues in the front line, um, those who work in the emergency department and my infectious disease colleagues locally, we have noted that when patients come in sick with COVID, um, one of our main questions that we ask them is, have you had a vaccination yet? And if they've had one vaccine, we've noticed that they tend to get less sick patients who've at least had one vaccination. So I wish I had a more concise answer for you for such a good question. It is not up to us in terms of, um, as as family doctors, as as small part line providers, in terms of determining who gets vaccined, uh, who gets the vaccination at what time, we have to follow the guidance that's given to us. Um, and, uh, we hope that we just get more supply in the next several months and that we can shorten the interval between the first and the second dose. Thank you. I'm going to get to Aswani's question in a second, but uh, Jerry is wondering, uh, were workers who received a dose of the vaccine in Canada given proof of vaccination and the name of the vaccine that was administered? So I can comment on my experience with COVAX on, which is the, um, the portal that we use to enter the information once we've given vaccinations. Um, every time we give a vaccination, there is a receipt that's produced, um, whether it's printed and given to the individual, some patients actually say, I don't need a receipt, but it's in the system. I'm not sure if anyone in the audience and the panelists can comment on that based on their direct experience with our migrant healthcare workers, uh, by migrant workers. I can comment, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, so anybody who uh, is registered to receive their vaccine um, from our perspective, um, <clears throat> we, we um, obviously have them in the COVAX system so they get that information. Um, the email address that is provided or the uh, phone number where they could receive um, messaging uh, is where that information goes. Um, so it, it's dependent on, on, um, on those things. Uh, we offered, um, because of the um, sensitivity for some of the workers that did not want the email uh, of the farm HR person off which was the which was often the person helping to um, um, manage these large groups for us um, we offered to have an email address for quest community health center um, uh, to be able to utilize uh, that uh, email address as well if they didn't have one to to uh, to use so we tried to be as sensitive as possible to the needs of the workers. Yeah, so I think this is a very important question. And just one um, a thing to bring to in terms of my experience to the table is that some of our patients with um, perhaps health conditions like dementia or issues with navigation, um, health literacy, for example, that um, they we have had elderly patients who've asked for the vaccine when they've already received the vaccine. And one important step to undertake if we're helping navigate patients to get vaccinated is to look in the COVAX on system to see if they've already had the vaccine and which one. And these and this information should be in there. Now, having said that, I recognize that there are patients who are undocumented um, who are also eligible for the vaccine and may not have had their names in the system for a specific reason. Um, you know, I, I do believe if you're a temporary worker and, and to have uh, are legally here, then you will be okay to be in the system, but there are some that will not want their names in the system. So just uh, something to think about if we're uh, navigating our clients to get a vaccination. Thank you. Uh, Iswani, did you wanna ask your question? Yes, um, what, what, one of my questions was already answered and it was about oh. that, the, the, the time between the, the one dose and the second dose. 
Um, but then that I am already here, and I would like to ask that I have heard too that the AstraZeneca, yes, it can um, produce blood clots, but if you recognize the symptoms, they are very easy, easy, easy to treat. Is that correct? Yes, I think the challenge for us is actually recognizing the symptoms because it is rare and we're not seeing a lot of them. But for my colleagues that, who work in the hospital who have seen one or two of them perhaps, um, we do have pro protocols in terms of how to address it once we know. And it, it does involve a blood test. So um, as part of the diagnostic um, workup, we can easily actually see a blood test that shows a pla the platelet counts going down as a marker for uh, this condition. Um, and we have our hematologist um, specialist colleagues to help us right away. Um, and blood thinners can be given if needed um, and diagnosed. So really, I think it's very important for us as the main points of contact initially of patients to just be vigilant about asking patients to receive the vaccine who've got symptoms that don't sound like the common side effects to check in with a family doctor um, and to have that, um, especially if it's an AstraZeneca vaccine that they're getting, um, to just evaluate if this is a common side effect or the extremely infinitesimally small, rare likelihood of getting uh, the blood, a blood clot. So I, I guess I'm continuing with that. Um, so like I know it's hard for migrant farm workers to reach out primary health. What would be the advice for them? Like, uh, what would be the advice in that situation? Call 911, even though it's not an emergency, where, where they should direct their concerns if they are feeling odd side effects? Yeah, that's a tough one to answer for me. Um, you know what, 911 is probably not the best option, I'm going to guess. Um, I'm not sure that our um, emergency uh, our EMS colleagues, I can't speak for them. I have high respects for them, but I'm not sure that that's a great way to actually find a diagnosis because, again, the challenge is diagnosing. Um, I, I uh, you know... Primary care is some is a space that I'm very, very committed to. And I hope that our migrant workers have good access to primary care. Can I ask this question from my CHC colleagues? What are your what's your advice in getting access to our um, services? Stay tuned for the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Awesome. Glad somebody has a good answer for this. Okay. I guess maybe one thing I would add is um, for, oh, sorry, my phone ringing. Um, in terms of whether or not they should call 911, it would depend largely really on their symptoms, I suppose. I mean, if they were truly unwell and they had neurologic symptoms, you know, unusual stuff like weakness on one side of their body, slurred speech, you know, of course, 911 would be very appropriate in those scenarios. If they had a persistent headache, right, beyond four days after their vaccine, then it would probably make more sense if they were able to, to go, they could go to the hospital, um, because you need some blood work in that case, or seek, go to an urgent care clinic if possible, Sometimes outreach work, uh, outreach clinics are available. I know with limited time frames, but if they happen to be uh, have access to one, that would be an option. And then there's always telehealth as well, right? In terms of they could call telehealth and maybe uh, talk about their symptoms and at least get get an opinion. Uh, the, the The answer may just be go to the hospital, but uh, it is at least you'll get uh, uh, to talk through some of your symptoms with someone. Um, to help triage the situation a little bit in terms of, you know, should you be calling 911 or uh, can it wait till tomorrow or should you go see, you know, go to the hospital? Um, so uh, we do have uh, some of the other questions that are coming up in the chat are going to uh, be part of the other presentations that are coming up. I know we're running short on time with Dr. Yu, um, and we have plenty of questions, and I, uh, I hope some of them will be answered as we move through the uh, other panels, but I'm going to take one more uh, from Fanny, because I saw her hand up just under the wire, um, and 
to let you know, Luz, uh, we are going to be talking about that through the, uh, talking about the uh, issue you raised through the, the panels as well. So um, I'm going to have a quick question. Um, we have a few workers in some hotels in this area, Haldeman County. There is one also in Brantford or two that came in March, had the vaccine and they, uh, they, uh, they have COVID right now. So they are in quarantine. Also, there is some that are coming. Uh, there is one in the area of Simcoe that was in quarantine, got the vaccine at the airport. Uh, he's, he has not been out of quarantine, but tested positive. So um, is there any information uh, given out to the workers um, at the airport or wherever? Uh, because some of them think that they are getting the, the virus from the vaccine. So I think it will be very important to probably give out information in Spanish. I don't know if there is anything in Spanish, but they get very anxious thinking that they have the virus and that's why they are getting sick. One of them has not even been out of, um, of the hotel, but yet he has COVID. So, um, so the, the, the anxiety level is really high. And my question is, um, do we have any information to give the workers about um, about uh, reaction or or of COVID nineteen or uh, with the vaccine? So uh, that's my question. Um, I can answer that, uh, David. Uh, Donna Brown here from Caribbean Workers Outreach Project. Um, so I was part of a pilot project. And Azwani could also um, answer to this as well, um, where we were at the airport, you know, just providing information to migrant workers. So they would ask us common questions about the vaccine, you know, which vaccine they're getting, side effects, and that kind of stuff. So uh, they are being provided with the information um, with regards to, you know, the vaccine that they're going to be receiving and whatever relevant um, questions they have, we try to answer their questions as well. Yes, and I would like to add that. So um, they are receiving uh, this bullet, you know, these resources that were developed through um, with OCAO, collaboration of OCAO and other organizations. These resources were, um, I think, in my, in my opinion, I, I helped with them too, and they were really well made because they were like, um, they are easy to understand. They are very specific and they are like very um, cultural. Um, like center. So um, they, they receive this and they, they receive a small conversation or like vaccination. I mean, it, it's difficult to give a whole overview, but uh, yes, they do. So thank you so much to Dr. Will and uh, to Dr. Yu for, um, for coming in and speaking with us. Uh, I've learned quite a bit and I know that there are more questions to answer and hopefully through the process of the next few speakers uh, we can get to. Uh, and we will have a question and answer period at the end. But yes, overall, thank you so much to Dr. Will and Dr. Yu. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, move on to uh, our next presenters who are gonna be talking about um, some key issues uh, around uh, vaccinations that have arisen through this process. So uh, we have Eduardo Huesca, who's going to be talking about uh, ensuring vaccine-related information reaches workers. Uh, Eduardo Huesca, Huesca is an outreach worker and program coordinator with the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers. He has worked directly with migrant agricultural worker communities for over 15 years, presenting occupational health and safety workshops on farms and in the communities at health and information fairs. Since January, Eduardo has focused on helping to get vaccine information to agricultural, agricultural workers across Ontario. So take it away. Thank you very, thank you very much, Eduardo. David, and thank you, everybody. So yes, uh, thank you so much. I'm Eduardo Huesca. I work for the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers, and I have the pleasure to work with a lot of 
of folks that are on this uh, on this call. Um, so I'm just going to be basically sharing a bit of information around um, vaccine information for agricultural workers, international agricultural workers, or migrant workers. Um, in no means are the resources I'm talking about the only resources in town. There's a lot more now available, uh, really great, uh, you know, initiatives of, of video use and, and just really um, engaging and good materials. It's just a, to, a little bit of an overview of what exists and kind of this, this focus around just making sure we're getting good, um, you know, well-sourced information to, to workers to help them make an informed choice. Um, so let me just next slide. Oops, okay. So yeah, uh, you know, the biggest focus for us has been you know, as, as agriculture workers continue to be offered vaccines is to ensure that they have access to, to well-sourced information um, so that, uh, you know, they can make a, a, a confident and, um, and informed decision. Uh, as we know, there's a lot of misinformation going around across all communities. So it's been really important to try to really, oops, uh, try to really address that. Um, there's been a lot of, you know, worries, questions, concerns I know from my family, uh, from friends I know, again, across all communities. Um, you know, a lot of communities have different experiences with vaccination. Uh, you know, in some, in some communities, some folks have experienced vaccination, you know, throughout their whole life or versions of vaccination, other folks haven't. Um, so it's definitely important to recognize that um, and really work uh, with communities from where they're at uh, in terms of the vaccine and vaccination kind of understanding. And even though, again, as, as folks are mentioning, um, you know, vaccination, goes back quite a long time and it saved a lot of lives uh, globally um, in terms of different vaccines and now the COVID vaccines, definitely it makes sense. There's a bit of unease, there's a bit of concern because, you know, we haven't necessarily seen something in a lot of our time, you know, uh, lives in terms of the scale and context of what's going on with COVID vaccines. But um, so it makes sense that, you know, folks are nervous and, and we're, you know, hoping to, to um, support them in, in that. So another part that we kind of based uh, some of our work around this on is, is, you know, recognizing again that the vaccines are strongly recommended as, as an important part of beating this pandemic um, and as a, an important part of protecting ourselves and, and those around us uh, from serious illness uh, with COVID-19. Recognizing, however, that it is a personal choice and that no nobody, including agricultural workers, should be forced um, or pressured to, to vaccinate. Um, and again, that makes the aim of, of all of this to really just support communities with good information so that they can make a, a confident informed choice. Um, you know, we're, a, we're an occupational health clinic or a network of occupational health clinics. So it's very important for us to always talk about the other safety, uh, you know, precautions and practices that are still very important to, to protect um, and stop the spread of COVID-19. Uh, so, and, you know, as was mentioned by Dr. Yu, uh, regardless of vaccination, if, if somebody chooses vaccination or not, it's it's still very important to follow all of those COVID-19 safety precautions. Um, as we continue to hear more about the risk of shared air and smaller particles um, of the virus. So, um, you know, it's just really important to be in the know to update, uh, be updated with, um, with science-based information around keeping safe uh, in addition to the vaccines. And as mentioned, um, you know, this comes a bit about uh, us still not being completely sure about you know, the duration of the vaccines in terms of their protection and as well as some, you know, some data looking at, you know, the, the vaccines protecting from illness versus how effective they are actually protecting from infection and transmission, right? And so it seems like early data is showing that the vaccines are protecting folks um, from actually getting it or, or spreading and other experts can kind of maybe speak a bit more to that, but that's still um, a bit unknown. So it's still uh, a focus on, on following uh, precautions. Um, I am just had one slide here just to talk a little bit about how we jumped in onto this topic, a bit of a timeline. Um, so around December, we started kind of hearing a bit of, of talk from communities around worrying that a lot of the agricultural worker communities, you know, had hesitancy around vaccination, had questions, had concerns. Um, some of this actually came from some uh, colleagues at Ontario Health West who had in December and earlier than that had been offering the flu shot to farms. Um, and they noted that there was a pretty low uptake in some, in some cases um, that they were outreaching to farms. And so that kind of got them, you know, thinking and asking questions about that. I know that other uh, vaccine flu, flu vaccine clinics had a, a, a more positive uh, experience during those months, but, but that definitely was something that was flagged. 
in January, it became kind of more, um, you know, uh, the issue started becoming more raised that we started hearing from other community members that, you know, in speaking to, to workers, they were, you know, hearing, again, misinformation or myths or were just had questions that were circulating, you know, here as well as in the home countries as well. Um, in January, that kind of spurred us to connect with some stakeholders to uh, form a little bit of a vaccine information working group. Um, and so we had various uh, stakeholders join, including folks from Windsor Essex, the health unit, the public health, uh, sorry, the CHC there, OMAFRA, um, the Alliance for Healthier Communities, uh, different organizations that were just trying to get together to say, how can we start preparing for, you know, information uh, and, and uh, getting it ready, you know, to start um, addressing or, or having this reach workers. And the idea was really to avoid this ha having to happen very quickly, right? Avoid having to then start struggling with getting key information to workers so short of a timeline when they're being offered. And so that was kind of the attempt to start this uh, as early as possible in January. And I put the little square above because it was, um, so vaccination phase one, this was all happening while obviously vaccines in Ontario are already um, being um, offered and, and taken up. Uh, uh, so we kind of had that lo uh, looming a little bit that vaccination started, but you know it didn't feel like uh, a lot of workers um, had a lot of information at that point. And I'm just gonna, Quickly uh, mentioned, so Oak, how we uh, collaborated on a uh, project with the Ontario Fruit and Vegetable Growers uh, Association. Um, and that pro the project focused on COVID-19 resources. So we were really focused on trying to identify what COVID-19 safety information workers had received and what, what information they hadn't received or what information they still uh, felt like they needed to receive. Um, and we asked uh, uh, other questions too, but that was kind of the gist of it. So. As part of this um, research project, we ended up doing some worker interviews. So we didn't interview a lot of workers. The total number of workers we interviewed was 27, but they were pretty in-depth interviews. Each interview lasted about an hour. Um, and some folks that actually conducted the interviews are, are here today as well. Um, but we interviewed 10 workers from the Caribbean community, 10 workers from the Latinx community, and seven workers from the Thai community. Um, and uh, the interviews took place uh, from February 21st to the to March 22nd, uh, 27th, sorry. And I just put really quickly here because this is something that jumped out uh, to us during those interviews that, um, you know, a large percentage of, of folks noted that they um, had not uh, received, um, oops, sorry, had not received information um, regarding vaccines. Um, so that was kind of a bit, you know, uh, um, a bit, of an alarm to us. Again, the numbers are small and it's not representative of, of everybody. And this was also during early on um, in the process of vaccination, but it was something that we definitely took note of. Um, oops. Uh, similarly, we also got uh, some data around whether workers felt that they had received enough information around vaccines. And so 26 out of 27 uh, workers that were interviewed uh, noted that they didn't feel like they had received enough information. Um, so again, that's kind of similarly got us, you know, identifying that this was an important uh, uh, issue to look into. Again, the numbers are low, but it was um, uh, definitely important. So we also asked as part of the survey uh, or the question, the interview, sorry, this, these additional five questions. So what do, what do you know about the COVID-19 vaccines? Um, uh, whether, uh, what information would be helpful? Uh, oops, sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble with this. Um, is there anything that you wanna know about the vaccines? Do you have any concerns about these vaccines? And if so, what are your concerns? So we, we got a lot of, of, uh, of responses from workers about these. Um, I'm not gonna share, um, go into them too, too much um, here uh, due to time, but a lot of them were generally what we're hearing from a lot of other communities that, you know, in terms of misconceptions around fear, um, side effects, whether again, they can get the vaccine, uh, sorry, the, the virus from the vaccine, um, uh, will, it, will it affect uh, fertility, um, things like that. Um, and, but it gave us a good basis to start trying to really figure out maybe what were some key points of information to look at. But again, it's, it's very similar to a lot of the, um, the misconceptions or, or concerns that are among, among everybody basically that we hear. Um, so early on, we tried to look around for examples of of different organizations kind of also trying to figure out how to best communicate uh, vaccine information to different communities, especially communities that have language, um, you know, barriers uh, that speak different languages. 
um, because a lot of you know the information initially was coming out mostly in English, but there a lot of translation has happened now, and a lot of translation happened quickly. But definitely, we're looking to, for best practices. So we we connected to um, a group of great organizations working with newcomer communities. So Refugee 613, Okasi, Taibu Community Health Center in Scarborough in Toronto, um, who works with the Black community, um, uh, the Chinese and South Asian Legal Clinic. And so they had uh, quickly partnered with some doctors from the University of Toronto, and they uh, started very quickly putting together these bulletins, these vaccine information bulletins. And they were really meant to try to really get at some key information. Um, the doctors, it was a great kind of collaboration between the groups that really know their communities, you know, know what the communities need, know how, you know, best to communicate with the communities, with healthcare, um, you know, providers and who have that expertise around, around the vaccines and, and everything. So it was, you know, that connection that, that was really great to, to see. Um, so it kind of inspired us to start uh, putting together some materials ourselves. This one was based on, on that bulletin of the other group. And so this is among some, uh, uh, one of the resources that, uh, that Donna and uh, Swani mentioned that has been circulating a bit. So this is just a general bulletin. Um, we were able to produce it in English, Spanish, and Thai. And again, as you can kind of see, and, and, we're, and I'm gonna share, I can share this whole PowerPoint uh, with anybody who's interested and I, I, put, I can put links in so you can get access to all of these resources as well. But it was just really meant to be a basic run through of you know, a bit of introduction to you know, key messages around vaccination, um, a bit about the vaccines, as mentioned, the difference between the mRNA vaccines and the viral vector vaccines, um, but just keeping it kind of general to, to help promote a bit of, of um, an understanding among workers. Um, we made it into a video as well. So the video is also available. It's about five minutes and, and, and uh, shares that information as well. Um, we then also uh, made this, this uh, uh, resource that looked at busting myths or addressing myths with facts. Um, and this kind of came again from those interviews that we did with workers um, around some of the misconceptions or, or myths that, uh, that workers uh, had heard. So the idea was to try to make this you know, interesting in, in these short kind of uh, you know, messaging. Um, and the person who really put this together for the project uh, was Mavra Kumar, who I think is also on, on, on uh, the call as well. So it was a lot of work around trying to see the myths and then, uh, you know, source, well-sourced uh, answers to these to share with communities as well. Um, and, uh, and these are, uh, this was also made to a video and, and the videos are, are, are available as well. Uh, the last resource we put together was a vaccine aftercare resource. So this also felt important for us. And, and as is kind of coming out in the conversation is to have, uh, you know, workers understand maybe what are the normal things that they might experience, you know, that that seems to be kind of a, a general experience for, for folks uh, having a vaccination. And uh, as but then to also be aware of, again, the rare cases of more serious reactions, but to, to be clear about what these reactions could look like so that, um, you know, they have a peace of mind to to know what they're looking out for. Um, and, and kind of at least have some guidance around what to do. And even to provide a little bit of assurance that, you know, when they get the vaccine, again, there's that period that they're going to, and, and I think more people are going to talk about that who are actually, you know, ran the clinics and, and worked at the clinics, but that, you know, time that they spend waiting um, after they get the vaccine to, to be um, taken care of from, by, by medical uh, uh, professionals. So th that, sorry, that uh, resource is also available in the video. Um, so here I just wanted to quickly share a, a landing page. So the Windsor Essex Health Unit wasn't able to join us there quite swamped as like uh, as everybody is um, in, and in the middle of their community vaccinations. But I wanted to share and this type of page, I think, exists in, in a lot of the regions. Um, it, it's just that uh, I've been working a bit with care in Windsor Essex. So we've kind of had a bit of experience more with with uh, the Windsor Essex uh, Health Unit. So this is the landing page that they've put together that I, I really um, you know, suggest checking out. It has a lot of resources. Um, again, each region it might be doing things a bit different, so it makes sense for for each uh, for each person to connect their public health unit and their local clinics. Uh, but this just gives you some general information. They've they've put some good information that's general, not necessarily regional specific, around you know um, you know information for workers and, and whatnot. Um, a, a big part as well is here. You can see the FAQs or the facts or the you know kind of uh, questions. And these actually seem to have come from workers themselves who went through the vaccination clinic at Windsor Essex. And the staff made note of some questions that they were asked. Um, and then now they've included it here to kind of re re-engage that to the community, right? So it's kind of this 
continually understanding what concerns and questions communities still have and, and getting the answers and kind of relaying them back to the community. So it's, it's kind of trying to create a dialogue, even though really um, this is, it's more a resource, a bit of a static resource, but it's, it's that. Um, this is a, a good component I've, I've seen as well um, in terms of a message. Um, so this, uh, the, the health unit has kind of put uh, a focus on informing employers what their roles are. Um, so it in very clear language talks about employers role, you know, to provide information um, around vaccines uh, in worker preferred language, ensuring, you know, they support uh, in terms of actually um, coordinating the worker or uh, the travel to the vaccination clinic, but they make it clear that um, in no way should an employer uh, pressure or, or um, reprise a worker for choosing not to to uh, vaccinate. Interestingly here, they also note that it's in the employer's responsibility to um, support the worker ensuring they have access to primary healthcare services, which touches on what we've mentioned. But I know colleagues uh, soon will, will talk a bit more about that. Um, I won't go too much more. These are, because uh, I think I'm probably already pretty over my time, but these are just other resources. The Windsor Essex Health Unit did a walkthrough video. So they actually took a video going into the space of their community vaccine clinic um, so that, uh, you know, all of the spaces and they had narration in multiple languages. So the work, you know, so this was spread uh, across worker communities channels um, so that the workers could kind of even get a sense of, the community could get a sense of uh, what that run through of that space would even look like. Um, I'm not gonna yeah, touch too much about this because I know my colleague from the Mexican council is gonna uh, talk more about this, but the Windsor, you know, again, this partnership between the health unit and the community was so important um, and care for international workers in Windsor Essex really took all the information the health unit was putting together and started really passing it through all of their, their community channels. Um, and so I know that the health unit mentioned that it was, you know, integral to, to having this information reach workers. Um, uh, again, there's more resources that I think are good to, to now um, consider, and I can share these afterwards. So, you know, again, here, viral vector vaccines. Um, the, the, maybe I'll just end it uh, in terms of um, this here. So, you know, I would just say there's been examples of, of folks getting really creative. So Jane Andres, who's part of the Kairos Network, you know, put together this really this video with a, a local musician, um, you know, talking about vaccination uh, in, in using music, uh, which, you know, I know has been greatly received uh, among the Caribbean community. Um, and it's just to kind of continue to partner with your local healthcare providers and health units to continue to identify what concerns, what vaccine related concerns and information gaps workers still have and trying to then, you know, troubleshoot getting, getting the answers and that information out. And also to kind of really um, support the building of confidence among workers to ask questions. So this line is from the Windsor Essex uh, resource, but it says, you know, just getting workers to, to feel comfortable asking questions or even pausing a, a situation to say, I still might not be, you know, confident yet, I have some questions. And I know uh, it gets tricky in terms of the role of the, of the uh, vaccinating staff to answer too many questions or how deep that history is going to get. And maybe we'll get into that, but, uh, but that's definitely something. And then the last yeah, thing, yeah, actually, last thing, we have. Sorry, yeah. oh, sorry. <laughs> we're going to have to, uh, okay, uh, yeah, it's it yeah. just these, yeah, sorry, these 911 videos just in, ar around, again, concerns around uh, uh, workers um, and, and well, uh, the unfortunate deaths that have happened during isolation. I know we've talked about that 911 might, might not be necessarily, but as we unpack that, it, it does really become very important to have workers know what to do in an emergency if they're being left alone and, and know who to call, whether it's somebody directly or 911, because it can really uh, make that difference. And these materials were put together uh, by a colleague of mine who's, who's up next as well. And yeah, so I'll leave it there. Sorry about that. Thank you, Eduardo. We're gonna move right into the next presenters who are uh, Michelle Tu and Stephanie Mayo. So Michelle is a certified occupational health nurse with a background in administration, research, education, consulting, and clinical work. Michelle has focused on the health and working environments of workers for the past 21 years. And since 2006, a large part of her work has been concentrated on migrant agricultural workers in Ontario uh, and Canada as a clinician, education, educator, researcher, and advocate. Stephanie Mayel is a PhD candidate in the Medical Anthropology Program at the University of Toronto, where her research investigates the ways annual temporary employment under Canadian Canada's seasonal agricultural worker program influences the health and well-being 
of Jamaican migrant workers uh, and is also a project coordinator with TNO's Empowering Migrant Workers in Ontario project. So thank you so much for contributing and take it away. Thanks so much, David, and to everyone at Kairos, thanks very much for inviting us to speak here today. Um, as members of the Migrant Worker Health Expert Working Group, uh, Michelle and I and our colleagues, Eduardo included, aim to keep abreast of advances and issues on the ground facing migrant agricultural workers in Ontario. And most recently, the vaccination process has become a leading concern and issue among international um, agricultural workers in Ontario. Uh, the Migrant Worker Health Expert Working Group is a team of community-based health researchers and clinicians, and we formed in April of last year to provide timely evidence-based recommendations to various levels of government uh, related to the health and safety of international agricultural workers across Canada during the pandemic and beyond. Um, and we want to start by acknowledging the tremendous efforts by public health units to keep us all safe during these unprecedented times. We appreciate the efforts that they and other stakeholders have taken to prioritize vulnerable populations, such as international agricultural workers. Um, because many of our worker friends from Latin America, the Caribbean, Asia, and other countries certainly do have questions and concerns about the vaccine that require accessible information delivery from health professionals, as we've touched on, and potentially in some cases, one-on-one -on -one communication prior to making an informed choice. Um, and further, we also want to draw attention to the power imbalance between employers and migrant workers in Ontario, um, and note that this presents unique challenges to obtaining um, informed consent from migrant agricultural workers. And since the inception of the various vaccination program rollouts for migrant workers um, in March, we have noted a number of key issues that have emerged across regions of the province. Um, and we clarified these issues and we formulated a series of recommendations that we then distributed um, via a letter to various public health units across Ontario, as well as community health centers, which have emerged in this discussion as an important stakeholder and partner. And so the first letter that we sent went out on March 29th of 2021. And I'm just gonna to touch on the four issues that we in the early stages of the um, vaccine pilot rollouts heard from workers and other um, stakeholders on the ground. And so the first of that was there was very little notice regarding the vaccine being provided to workers and little to no opportunity for questions or a process to ensure informed consent. And again, this is situated back in March. Um, we also noted that workers with chronic health conditions or other health issues which may be affected by the vaccine were not given an opportunity to consult with a medical practitioner as is the recommendation regarding the appropriateness of vaccine. Um, and then the third issue was that workers were not provided a copy of the vaccine consent form or little if any time to read it before being asked to sign. Some did not know which vaccine brand they were receiving when they were being asked to sign the form. And then the fourth uh, issue that we noted was that in some cases, workers were being threatened by employers that if they did not take the vaccine, their employment would be affected. That is, they would not be called back next year um, and threats of reprisals emerged um, as a big issue. And so a month sort of into the vaccination efforts, we continued to hear reports on the ground and we were continued to be very happy to see some new um, you know, pilot initiatives emerge in various regions, as well as um, the airport project to emerge. And so this also prompted a follow-up letter a month later, which I'm going to turn over to my colleague, Michelle Tu at the Occupational Health Clinics to talk a little bit more about. Thanks, thanks, Steph. Um, uh, the first point uh, that we've noted in the follow-up letter is um, that uh, certainly the vaccine portfolios in the sending countries are not the same as the vaccines that are being offered in Canada. And uh, in Mexico, for example, I think that there's at least five different vaccines that have been um, approved, uh, most of which have not been approved in Canada, so therefore are not available to those workers 
Moderna, uh, for one is not um, uh, used in Mexico that we know of. And in the Caribbean countries at present, it seems that AstraZeneca is the primary uh, vaccine that's available. Um, but the, the question uh, remains for the workers who already received an initial vaccine uh, in their home countries, whether they'll be able to get a second dose of that uh, vaccine um, or something similar in Canada. And at this point in time, um, as we've heard already, that the mixing of uh, uh, vaccines is not um, been studied and is certainly not recommended. The second point uh, Steph already mentioned, um, but uh, uh, concerned that we continue to hear from workers um, threats of reprisal uh, if they do not get the vaccine, such as not being invited back the next year. And the workers uh, who receive the vaccination at the um, airport uh, are, um, you know, being uh, transported to all different regions of the province. And at this point in time, it's not clear what the follow-up will look at look like for those workers to ensure that they have uh, get their um, second dose in a timely manner. Uh, uh, workers who receive a first dose of the vaccine in Ontario have been scheduled to receive or will be scheduled to receive a second dose um, four months later, uh, regardless of the duration of their time in Canada. And most well, most um, contracts are. Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of six months. There are some workers who are here for less than four months and, and therefore um, uh, trying to sort out how, uh, how to ensure that they get a second dose um, will be a challenge, uh, but hopefully that will be worked on. We've also heard several reports um, continue, as Steph had, had mentioned, um, that workers weren't given the opportunity to have the questions answered about the vaccine. Um, there's lots of um, information that uh, has been made available um, for workers that was identified by Eduardo, um, et cetera. Uh, but um, we all know that if we're going to get the vaccine and we have questions about it, that we really, um, in some instances, really need to have a conversation with a clinician in terms of whether that's going to have a negative uh, outcome on them. Um, and so, uh, they, we came up with um, uh, a series of recommendations which are detailed on our website uh, regarding the pre-vaccination period, uh, vaccination scheduling for the first dose, vaccination scheduling for the second dose, um, and some, some particular considerations about uh, vaccine locations and the vaccine process. Uh, particularly uh, trying to ensure that workers would be able to ask questions about the vaccine and its appropriateness um, for them at, at the vaccination clinics. I've talked um, to uh, one public health unit and they were trying to coordinate that they had primary care um, clinicians at all of the vaccination clinics that they were running for microfarm workers so that workers um, could have the opportunity to ask a, a clinician specific questions about um, their health care and also specific recommendations about reprisal um, uh, considerations uh, because workers, uh, the, the main message is that um, the vaccine is a choice and if workers um, choose not to have a vaccine, which is different from refusing a vaccine, um, that they um, should not uh, have negative uh, consequences in relation to that. So, uh, just want to end the, this section by saying thank you um, to Kairos and all of the speakers today, and especially a very big thank you to the public health professionals and community partners who are working so hard to keep everyone in Ontario safe and healthy. It is a tough go out there right now for them, and we really appreciate all their efforts. If you'd like any um, further information about the migrant uh, uh, work the Migrant Worker Health Expert Working Group, it's a long, it's a long name, um, and the specifics about the recommendations, please visit our website. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle and Steph. Um, so we're going to be moving into a section on experiences from vaccine clinics uh, across Ontario. Um, so I have a presentation from uh, Nancy Garner. Uh, we're going to have Nancy Garner, Alejandro Noriega, Donna Brown, uh, Elizabeth Espinoza, and Aswani Kano uh, giving uh, sort of updates from uh, 
across the regions. Uh, so Nancy Garner is the executive director of Quest Community Health Center in St. Catharines. Prior to this role, Nancy was the chief operating officer at Good Shepherd Nonprofit Homes, Inc., uh, Hamilton and Toronto, which provides support and housing for homeless individuals living with mental health and addiction challenges. Uh, so if you want to go ahead, Nancy, um, and we are going to try to have time for questions at the at the end of this as well, but we're just looking for uh, some context uh, across uh, the different regions that the project is operating within. So here is Nancy. Thanks, David. So um, yeah, I'm uh, also here with uh, Amy Fishley. Amy has a very, very, very long title. She's the primary care and stakeholder engagement advisor with the Niagara Region Public Health. And um, so we will be sharing this presentation with you. So this is a, a, an initiative that um, Quest Community Health Center and uh, Niagara Region Public Health and Niagara Health Services undertook um, to begin vaccinating um, seasonal agricultural workers in Niagara. And um, we thought we'd just do some quick introductions. And I don't know if Amy, if you wanted to say anything before I moved on. Um, just to put some context, so um, just wanted to tell you a little bit about Quest Community Health Center, um, uh, our seasonal agricultural worker health program. Um, we get about 3,500 seasonal agricultural workers in Niagara each year. Um, most are from uh, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Latin America. Uh, the majority identify as male and the average age that we see at Quest is 46 years of age, but I understand that the average age in the region is about 36 um, years of age. Some of the issues that we see for primary care are top issues are muscular skeletal, as you can imagine, due to the um, uh, physical nature of the work, um, chronic disease, uh, lots of uh, diabetes and hypertension, environmental allergies um, and dermatological issues, uh, often, again, uh, related to the um, environment that they work in. Quest has been providing primary care to seasonal agricultural workers in Niagara for about 10 years. Um, we, uh, we have received some funding a number, initially we were doing this on a voluntary basis, and then later received some funding from the Lynn um, to hire um, a community health worker, a half-time nurse, and a 0 0.06 of an FTE physician. Um, since its inception, we've grown from 50 clients to over 600 and increasing uh, every year. We see clients about three times a year. So um, we've seen, we typically um, uh, have about uh, 1,800 visits with our clients. Uh, and we do this with um, we, a number of ways. We um, provide our services uh, at lunchtime, um, evenings and Sundays primarily to um, be available to, to workers when uh, they have their time off work. And we actually have two um, community partners um, in Virgil and Vineland uh, where we have clinics um, within two churches uh, uh, Virgil is Cornerstone Community Church and Vineland is um, Southridge uh, Community Church and we have a group of volunteers that help with that we have um, um, I can just show you some of our partners so we have um, uh, learners from uh, McMaster University we have um, nurses who uh, uh, nursing students from Brock um, and we have also um, a number of community uh, service providers that assist in volunteering with those clinics. Um, as part of the clinics, we have dietitians and, and um, counselors. We've noticed in the last couple of years that our need for um, um, counseling has increased as a result of the uh, pandemic. And so we've ensured that there are in increased resources uh, uh, available to the workers. They, uh, we also found out last year as uh, that a number of people didn't have uh, access to um, phones. So we were able to um, 
it's great having some some young staff on on, on <laughs> young people on staff so you know they always want the greatest and latest phones so they've got a bunch of phones in their in their drawers at home so we're able to get sim cards and uh, get phones out to people um, that didn't have access to a phone to connect with us maybe i'll pass this over now to um, amy just to talk a little bit about our stakeholder group and then we can talk about our uh, vaccine clinics um, this is just kind of a neat kind of intro into the the true partnership and collaboration that the vaccination clinics were in niagara so I get the great pleasure of being the Migrant Agricultural Worker Stakeholder Group um, Chair. Uh, and I just stepped into the role in, De in December and I am in awe of the group of people around the table and their passion and their drive. So um, really this group came together to strengthen communication and connections with those in the community who are working with this population and really in response to the large amount of COVID-19 outbreaks that we are actually experiencing on farms. Uh, so this group really utilizes a, a collaborative approach to support migrant farm workers in Niagara. And as you can see, probably from the next slide, Nancy will pull up around the membership. Um, there are individuals from various sectors represented at the table, including primary care, social service organizations, and spiritual groups, and so many more that probably aren't listed. But yeah, we're extremely grateful for all of those folks and what they do for our community on a regular basis outside of the pandemic uh, to have meaningful impact on this community. Uh, so I'm, as I'm sure you can attest to, uh, the pandemic has really brought to light many health inequities uh, that migrant workers experience. Um, so maybe, yeah, well, look at you, you're going next slide already. You're so good, Nancy. Uh, always, in, always in rhythm with each other. Uh, with this in mind, the group really set the goals of supporting access uh, to primary care for this population and supporting and influencing social determinants of health of this population. We know this is an ongoing issue. Um, so from there, the group split into subgroups and, and got to work. Uh, so you can see um, on this screen, they did, uh, there was a COVID action planning and coordinated outreach group. This group really looked at developing proactive and reactive response process maps to respond to COVID-19 issues, but in a really coordinated kind of way. These maps not only included primary care pieces such as testing and health checks, but also connected workers to social services. Um, and these maps truly hinged on very strong communication between uh, members and uh, Nancy and Quest were just phenomenal when it came to this and their patience with us and trying to jive and, and you know, break through some barriers that sometimes can exist at uh, government levels. Um, so, and then the community, the coordinated outreach piece really focused on uh, connecting primary care with socially and culturally appropriate connects in the communities to support workers really as a more holistic kind of approach. Um, and then there was the education and resources subgroup, which is ongoing. So they're developing a repository of culturally appropriate resources to support migrant workers, which essentially is a living document on a Google Doc site we have for the group. So it'll, we can update it as needed. So everybody has the most up-to-date information. Uh, we also had the little ad advocacy subgroup as well, which saw some agencies kind of rally around the um, federal government's housing consultation. So there was a few submissions around that piece too. Um, I'll end with just kind of the beyond piece. So I'm, again, some real strengths of this group were identified and the improved connection and communication has really allowed us to respond to outbreaks promptly and really, really get to workers quicker, which is really what we want. Um, so this, the work of this group and the collaboration is ongoing and has allowed for networking, sharing information, resources and opportunities, which really in turn will only serve to benefit our migrant uh, farm worker community. Um, so yeah, Eduardo hit on it earlier around the importance of connecting with community and public health. So yeah, I encourage you to do so if you have the opportunity within your own communities. And I think with that, I'll, I'll toss her back to Nancy so she can get into the, the good stuff. Yes, thank you, Amy. And uh, I would say that it's uh, certainly um, the collaboration with uh, Niagara Region Public Health has been uh, phenomenal. Um, and um, so this is just a, a photo here of the vaccine center in St. Catharines, which is the main vaccination uh, center for the region. Um, Niagara community, uh, Niagara's Community Coordination Task Force for COVID-19 vaccination really prioritized agricultural and farm workers, uh, including international agricultural workers for vaccination based on a number of risk factors. Um, so the group was identified in the context of planning for congregate living settings. Um, I happened to have the pleasure of sitting on that task force. So I was uh, involved right um, at the start of, of, uh, of these discussions. 
And, and some of those risk factors were um, the risk of exposure to infection with just the ongoing inflow of new arrivals, um, risk of transmission within congregate settings, both within their living situations and, and also their work environments uh, within greenhouses, um, the risk of severe illness or death due to increased prevalence of um, chronic health conditions within the migrant uh, worker population, and then just the risk to disruption to critical food supply chains in the local economy. So we felt that this was a really um, important um, group of individuals to, to um, prioritize for vaccines. Um, since last spring, Niagara has seen several COVID-19 outbreaks on farms, uh, which really has placed a fair bit of pressure on local health and public health services. So it just made sense to, to vaccinate this population if they were interested in, in uh, receiving the vaccine to really ensure ongoing capacity uh, to focus the resources on the rollout of the vaccine and contact tracing and, and managing outbreaks and really providing care to people in hospital. So the more, obviously, the more people that get vaccines, the, the uh, less pressures on some of those parts of the system. Um, so to be eligible for a vaccine, um, um, let me just go through here. Um, let me just backtrack a bit. So um, when the um, provincial mandate for the 80 plus uh, individuals, um, 80, age 80 plus individuals um, was rolled out to, to uh, receive vaccines in the community. Um, um, before the next cohort, age cohort was announced, there were spaces um, at the vaccine center to, to be filled. Um, so the task force decided to launch a pilot to see if seasonal agricultural workers were interested in, in um, receiving their vaccines to fill some of those spaces. Um, and so uh, a pilot was launched. Um, I have to say that it was uh, quite a, an, an incredible effort on behalf of the region and Niagara Health Services and, and um, my own um, health center to um, quickly connect with um, uh, farms that were identified at high risk. Um, so those were farms that already had a number of a large number of seasonal agriculture workers on site and were uh, primarily greenhouse workers. So um, I spent a weekend reaching out to those farms and um, you know, speaking with the farm operators and providing information in both English and Spanish uh, so that they could um, um, disseminate that information to their workers to see who would be interested in receiving the vaccines. As a result of that, um, we had um, uh, 316 workers uh, who had received their vaccine. And just to talk about the logistics of some of these things. Um, um, so uh, workers have to be transported uh, in their cohorts. So, so um, the, we really had to rely on the farm operators to work with us um, to ensure that um, their cohorts were arriving separately and, um, and that people were, were provided um, the information in, in their uh, preferred language and had that opportunity to <clears throat> understand uh, what the vaccine was and uh, what it would entail. Um, as well, um, just uh, the logistics of all of, of having uh, interpreters and uh, physicians and uh, parent care practitioners who spoke Spanish um, at, at the vaccine center um, as well to ensure that uh, people were receiving the information uh, uh, in a culturally appropriate way. Also, um, so the pilot seemed to be fairly successful and as a result, we were receiving a number of calls saying that um, there was interest on farms to uh, in, um, increase the number of people to be able to receive the vaccines. So um, <clears throat> we were able to work together. Um, so Public Health, Niagara Health Services, um, and uh, Quest worked very closely together to um, have two days. Uh, it was a Saturday and Sunday in April where workers were able to receive their vaccines. Um, so information again went out to all farms, to um, uh, the various um, associations 
uh, affiliated with farming in the region and um, to let them know that this was uh, an option. Um, we had over two days, we had over uh, 3000 individuals come through um, to receive their vaccines. Um, and again, they had to come in their cohorts um, and um, uh, were provided information in, in their language of choice. I happened to be at the front registration and was um, um, able to see people um, coming in. And I'll, I'll say that there was one fellow who just looked, stood there and was looking out and, and I asked him if he was okay. And he just said that he just, it was just so, so surreal for him to see such a large vaccine center and um, just, he just wanted to take it all in before he got his vaccine. Um, he was very excited to be there. Um, and, um, I, you know, we heard many, many comments of that regard. People could receive their vaccine if they were uh, an international agricultural worker, if they were a Canadian worker who worked um, a shoulder to shoulder with the, with the uh, international workers, um, or any Canadian workers in the agriculture and farming sector who couldn't, uh, who can't work from home. So um, uh, that was the criteria. They did not have to have a health card. If they had a health card, that was great. If they had an expired health card, that was okay. If they had a passport, that was fine. So um, uh, they all understood that they were receiving the Pfizer um, um, a vaccine and um, um, or provided uh, information about about aftercare as well. Uh, um, Quest Community Health Centre prior to this went out to farms and was doing um, um, educational um, sessions for uh, farm owners and operators and, and uh, workers um, just to answer any questions that they may have about the vaccine and um, um, to kind of do that preliminary work. Obviously we couldn't get to all of the farms, but we went to some of the larger farms um, to be able to, to um, answer their questions, as well as from the pilot. And um, we were able to develop a number of questions that farm op operators uh, were, were asking us. And we ended up um, having a, a, a FAQ document that went out to farm operators um, answering their questions um, uh, pertaining to the vaccine as well. So uh, in moving forward with the larger uh, vaccine um, initiative. Um, as some people were still in quarantine, um, their 14 day quarantine, they were unable to get their vaccine within those two days. And so we've seen since another um, uh, 670 people and plus um, receiving their vaccines after that uh, weekend um, um, uh, vaccine initiative, um, just because they were now eligible to receive their vaccine. Um, and, and they're still trickling in. And again, we're still providing um, uh, interpretation services there. So we could speak about this forever, but I will wrap it up in the last couple of slides. I just wanted to put this out here. I thought it was very cute. So at the vaccine center, everybody gets a post-it note and they can put it on the wall and put their comments on there. And I, I wanted to put this one because it says, you know, gracias, muchas gracias, que, que Dios siga um, bendiciendo a Canadá y todo su gente. Gracias, 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 gracias. So it's uh, basically this uh, individual was saying, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and that uh, God continue to bless Canada and all of its people. Um, and I thought it was just so sweet um, to see that uh, up there. And then some comments just from the farm operators thanking, thanking um, uh, us, uh, all of us who were involved in this initiative um, and how grateful they were. So I think we can end it at that point. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, to keep moving through the regions, uh, we have uh, Alejandro Noriega, uh, who is currently the acting consul at the Consulate of Mexico in Leamington. Uh, today, he participates in his capacity as a member of uh, Care for International Workers. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, today, I am participating just as a member of uh, a community uh, partnership uh, that we have in Windsor Essex. 
basically providing my uh, individual, my personal, not personal, but my individual point of view on how the vaccination effort is rolling out in, in the Windsor Essex County. Uh, so first I will briefly uh, explain you what, what CARE is, how it, this is made up. Uh, and then the, the conversations that we engaged with uh, the Windsor Essex Health Unit, which is the organization, the agency in charge of the vaccination effort in this county. And then the on-site personal experience at the, at the vaccination center in Leamington. CARE, it is basically a community association, a community partnership made up of nine agencies. We are all uh, settled in the Windsor Essex County, but some of our activities or some of the activities of the members extend beyond uh, in some other areas of Southwestern Ontario. Uh, CARE stands basically for community assistance, resources, and education. Our main goal is to support international workers or workers in the agricultural sectors coming from abroad in, in different ways, uh, providing different uh, resources. CARES, CARE was created in 2016, and the Consulate of Mexico and Limington joined in 2018, and some other agencies have been uh, joining CARE over the years. This, uh, this is the list of uh, the current members. As you may see, uh, you, uh, the, the members, the partners in this group provide different various set of services from the legal guidance of the bilingual legal clinic, the, the founding member, so to speak, uh, the OCAO, as uh, Eduardo already explained very well there, his uh, activities within OCAO, uh, all the way, we have various activities all the way up to meditation and spiritual support. Uh, and the consulate, I may say, is the only uh, organization with a different purpose, with a different nature here, because we are the only foreigners here. Uh, but all of us join us the common goal to take care, to look after uh, temporary foreign workers in the agricultural sector. And uh, with this purpose, we uh, approach the, the local health unit, which to, to see how the efforts were uh, developing towards the vaccination, uh, in, specifically for this sector, for the temporary foreign workers. Uh, we engage in a, at individual level, different organizations, different members of CARE with uh, which, but also collectively at a certain point, we decided to participate collectively in this dialogue with uh, which. Uh, these uh, conversations, uh, I mean, started, we will say from since last year, uh, have been uh, permanent or, or on a very regular basis, uh, but Talking specific, specifically about vaccination, uh, last since last March or maybe February, uh, as a result of these conversations, we were invited by the health unit to to join the efforts. First of all, in the preparations of the actual vaccination rollout, first delivering or trying to deliver delivering more information to the workers in order that they uh, have um, uh, they have the opportunity to make a, a well-informed decision about receiving or not the vaccination in Canada, the vaccine in Canada. Uh, so we develop, they develop, uh, uh, we should develop several materials. Some other agencies like um, OCAO already have some other materials that in Spanish, and we help, for example, from the consulate and the other partners in care, we help to, to spread the, the work, to, to, to try to promote this information campaign in our social media and, and in all the possible 
means at uh, our reach. Coincidentally, I mean, it is not an accident that many of the information, it was the same or very similar information that the workers were receiving since coming from Mexico. In this case, I speak from, uh, from the Mexican experience uh, because I, I know, uh, I mean, I am closer to, to, this, uh, to this experience. Uh, what are the main messages? That, that the vaccination was uh, safe, that it goes, it went through a formal process of approval uh, for, for its use. And very important that the vaccination it was not mandatory, it is not mandatory, but it is highly recommended. It is the best way to protect oneself and the uh, co-workers uh, and the community in general, also the beloved ones. Uh, at the end of the day, the goal was again to try to provide information in order that they take the, an informed, a well-informed decision. The, the final uh, or, or the last point of this campaign was the, a video that uh, Eduardo already mentioned, then basically uh, guide you through what to expect on the vaccination day. What, what was the path, uh, the path to follow at the vaccination center? Uh, the vaccination center was set in, in Leamington, you know, uh, between the municipality of Leamington and Kingsville. It is, uh, it is uh, these are two areas of high concentration concentration of uh, foreign workers. Uh, the vaccination center was set at the recreation complex in town. It, it is a, a, a very proper location for these purposes. It, it can receive uh, a large number of people. Uh, and the main uh, purpose for, for uh, the care partners to be there was double. First of all, to continue with our efforts uh, of uh, supporting, temp supporting temporary foreign workers on site, providing uh, more than providing information, conveying that information in their language, uh, being sensitive on the cultural uh, side of things, on the cultural hesitancy on the information that they were receiving, receiving from, from home. Uh, and the other thing, uh, purpose that we tried to achieve was to uh, take advantage of the opportunity and offer our services, uh, the very services we provide in a, in a short uh, flyer. Uh, I would say, well, first of all, uh, the, the experience was very, the experience of the vaccination was very positive. The vaccination started uh, on uh, April 18th. It continues until this week. Uh, uh, a change of uh, 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 in the which criteria or the original criteria for receiving the vaccination was uh, to offer the vaccine to those workers living in congregate living settings. On that day, on April 18, we uh, learned that we should uh, widen this criteria to all the staff. Uh, uh, farm staff uh, in close interaction with uh, temporary foreign workers or close, close interaction with those living in congregate settings, which uh, again, here, my personal point of view is uh, this decision was very positive. It builds on the, on the immunity of, uh, of the community. Also, again, a, a personal point of view, it was very positive that the employers were engaged in, in, uh, in a way that they supported, uh, they provide, provided support to the temporary foreign workers for the registration process, all the way to the transportation, uh, and also through their supervisors, on-site support also with languages and on, uh, uh, filling out uh, the, the um, consent form uh, and uh, uh, answering questions. Of course, there are there are things that can be improved. Of course, there are uh, this extru structural imbalance that we we all know. It is a risk, and uh, uh, sometimes that we uh, 
put too much confidence on the employer who has a, an advantage in, in several ways. But as far as I could witness at, at, in this experience at the vaccination center, this uh, support provided by employers has been very, very constructive. Uh, all the process for the vaccination is, uh, I only can, can commend uh, with your efforts. Everything is well organized. The, the, from the reception, uh, actually going with the nurse to receive the vaccine and the waiting period for any, in case of any negative uh, secondary effect, all the process takes around 30 minutes maximum, and I, roughly, and I think it, it is, it works very well. Um, here, the, this is uh, one of the of our partners on site. On site, we, when 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 we enter in this dialogue with the workers, we have a very different. Um, sorry for that. We have a uh, very positive feedback in general. Uh, there are some hesitancy still. There are some, uh, let's say, misguided. There are some myths, but nothing really impeding the, the possibility to take uh, the vaccine. Actually, most of them um, being there willingly uh, uh, and knowing that it was also an opportunity because, because what back home, uh, only grandparents normally, only grandparents have received the, the vaccine. Uh, and according with, uh, I mean, this is not a survey at all, but according with some uh, conversations with employer, up to 90% of the foreign workers are willing to accept the, the vaccine. In conclusion, I would say that uh, the experience in, in this dialogue and, the, and this uh, partnership with the uh, uh, Windsor Essex Health Unit has been very, very positive it, uh, in the sense that it has, uh, it has been an opportunity to provide uh, support and information to, to the workers. Uh, we only can hope to continue with and work to continue with this uh, collaboration in order to uh, to provide more support in the future. Of course, of course, uh, there are uh, things that we can improve, the needs to be improved, but in, in general, the, the experience so far has been very positive with a very constructive approach by all the parties involved. Regarding the challenges, I, uh, my, my personal opinion, uh, the, the one in the short run is to make sure or how we make sure that those workers workers scheduled to travel back home before receiving the second shot, how do they actually receive it? Uh, in order that they, that they have the, com, the, com, the two doses, the, the full uh, inoculation, yeah. uh, and also because uh, uh, I mean, it's a health issue, uh, uh, it, uh, it is important to to trying to prevent uh, uh, the, the uh, to 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 get the the disease, but also because these individuals are coming back next year, hopefully, and it is important for all of us, and uh, they complete the immunization. Uh, there are other things, but so far, again, I cannot stress that this has been a very positive experience in the, the Windsor Essex County. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alejandro. Hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth. I'm the outreach coordinator for the Durham region uh, area. Um, here we have been working very close with the, with the workers, giving them information as much as we can for the with the vaccine or in general any information we can we can give them the first problem we encountered was uh, that the workers most of them they are in areas where where they didn't have access to to the internet so obviously we could not deliver to them through whatsapp or or emails so we did came our team came with the idea to make these folders 
and give to the workers, either if the workers they were getting uh, they were getting to Canada to their quarantine in the hotel. So we were going the days before to the hotels and delivering uh, this folder with any information we could find. And some of the information was the one Eduardo just shared uh, before. It was the meat and facts. So we include whatever we could gather from, from the partners or resources that, that we have. In general, here in Durham, most of the workers they are been receiving the, the vaccine, at least from the farms that we have more, more contact with. Um, all of them, they were, before even we asked them if they were thinking what they think about the vaccine, they were just a step forward. They were asking, when are we getting the vaccine? How can we get it? How can we register? So the farm owners, they are being very um, uh, engaging with the workers and taking them, making the, um, the appointments and taking them to get the, the vaccine. One of the main questions that the worker have is that some of them, they did arrive in January. So they're supposed to leave in the very first days of July. And it's been bringing them a lot of anxiety and they are very worried because the days that they give them to get the second shot of vaccine is into the days in August. So we are been working with the public health units here in Durham to see what we can do uh, regarding that. Because even for some of the workers, they, they know that in the areas that they live back home, they are not receiving the same vaccines that they got uh, here. So that even yesterday, I have a conversation with some workers that they call me. Did, did you find a, any information? Um, what is gonna happen with us? because they are very worried. What is gonna happen? I did got my first dose of vaccine. What is gonna happen with my, with my second one? So it's, it's the main thing that is happening in the region with those workers that they arrive in early January, beginning of February, and they are leaving in the month of July if, if their flies and everything goes in the way that's supposed to be. And then their days for the vaccination is into the August. The other thing is that for those workers that are being arriving and getting the vaccines in the, um, in the airport, they do have the car where it says um, the vaccine that they got, the lot number and so on information, but they don't know, they don't have a day on when are they gonna get the second shot or, or where. So this is another thing that the, the region, the, the Durham Health uh, Department is working on hopefully receiving information from those uh, clinics that they were in the, in the airport and then booking those workers for when their second uh, shot is, is available uh, for. Um, th this, is, uh, this is what I can say from, from the Durham region. And again, most of the farms, they already registered their, their workers. And even those ones that they didn't have the first shot, they have already, uh, the day that they can go and put the first vaccine. There was also many questions regarding the health care because um, some workers, even they are here for like a two months or three months, they didn't receive their health care yet. And the farm owners uh, reached to us what we're gonna do because some workers, they did not receive the health care, but we could provide them with the information that they were still eligible to go and do the vaccine. And they were very happy that they could take the workers even without the health care. So this is uh, what is happening around here. And I'm not gonna take more time because I know we are very short of the time today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, Aswani, did you have anything to add as well? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I am working with you, you know, um, I am an outreach worker. So I have close contact to the workers and I have had a great opportunity to participate in different uh, vaccination clinics which is great, has given me the opportunity to be um, reaching the workers and see how it's working and how it's uh, been accepted to them. So I've been actually in the airport and I've been in Limington in different clinics. And I just, uh, I know in the airport we share this document, like uh, is the one that uh, we created with, um, oh, sorry, oh, oh, sorry, yeah with OCAO in collaboration with OCAO of OCA. It is, like I say at the beginning, a great document because it's very uh, easy to understand. 
it's um, it has even like some uh, codes that you can scan, and I keep telling them like, do you have time? And if you are bored, like when you're gonna be um, in quarantine, you can scan these codes, and then you can go and um, watch the videos if you don't want to read. So um, I think mainly uh, I can say that they are like uh, very happy. Like mo most of them, they want to receive the vaccine. They are. Um, they, they want to protect themselves. They want. Um, I mean, in, in Mexico, the situation is not that easy um, with COVID. So they they feel like um, they want the vaccine. And I think all the organizations uh, they have done a lot of uh, work and a really good job. And how they provide it, how is the process? I agree with Elizabeth that um, kind of the main concern is like the second dose. Right, like how it's gonna happen, when it's gonna happen. But um, besides that, I can think that uh, resources is important because um, they need the resources. They need that. And when they go to the airport, I think that something that is great is that they have the time to rest. Right, they go and they have time to uh, have some time off. I don't know how it is with the other with the other clinics. I'm thinking like if they go to work. Um, do they have time to rest? That's kind of my main concern um, myself, right? Like, do they have time to rest, time to take off time uh, after the vaccine? Um, the other thing that I can uh, say I, and I can share is that they, the workers, they, they, they like to have the information, right? And they, it's very important that they know that it's completely volunteer, uh, that we reinsure that. Uh, I know other airport we do that and in the other parts with farms and things like that i don't know how can we ensure that farmers tell their workers that it's optional that's um in, in my perspective that's something that it would be very important to acknowledge um and i think that's it for me i don't know if there is more questions i just like to add david that i find out also in in, in our region that when we give this folder or the information before they are receiving the vaccine, it prevented from having questions because when they make it to many of these clinics, there is no Spanish speaking uh, person <laughs> in most of the cases. So at least they are prepared to don't have as many questions and then they cannot be answered in their own, in their own language because many of them, they cannot understand English. And I like to add that, like in the, in the uh, vaccination clinics that I have in part of it, there is always a support for the Spanish or for language support. So um, the consulate is very is being very uh, active on that too. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it has been great to see that there is a lot of language support in the clinics that I've been participating on. Mm -hmm. uh, they have also like um, in in Limington in the in the uh, clinic in Limington, the nurses they have like a, a line like a telephone line that they can call directly with interpreters that are online. So I think that the issue for, for not having um, interpretation does not issue in, in my experience. The other thing that I'm liking um, to do, like uh, if they are not gonna do it in the airport, it is great to have those resources. So I am outreach worker. And I think that for all the organizations um, that we are like in, in close contact with my grandfather workers, I'm just sending the information. Um, to them, right, like videos so for vaccination, all the information that I have, which is very um, versatile because sometimes you can it, it just have a WhatsApp link, so you just send it through WhatsApp, and I forward that to my clients mm -hmm. before they go to the to the clinics to make sure that they read it. And like I say, there is videos, so you can send the videos. So um, yes, thank you for everybody for um, there's been so much information in this webinar, and I'm grateful that this will be posted to the. Uh, Kairos website so that people can uh, take their time and sort of uh, look for resources out of it. And there's been quite a few resources in the chat, so feel free to save that chat as well for uh, all of the links that have been included. Um, I want to thank everybody who has spoken and uh, asked questions through this process. Thank you so much to all our presenters, everybody for coming, and we will see you at the next one, which I believe is about uh, open work permits, uh, sort of further exploring uh, those open work permits. So thank you everybody for your patience, for all of the wonderful information, and we will see you at the next one.